I've almost completely stopped eating, mainly one meal a day in the evenings. Always feel full, as my mom says, yeah, just full all the time, and the weight seems to fall off. Right. Hey. It's probably lost 25 kilos. In six to eight months? Yeah. That's but that's the entire action of this product. It's off-label, yes. because it's actually a type 2 diabetes drug. I'm Carol Ofori, and this is the Carol Ofori Podcast for thought-provoking conversations. There's a new weight loss craze that's taking the world by storm with many people reporting great success. It is a medication used to treat patients diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, but is now also being used for weight loss, with many doctors prescribing it off-label for this purpose. Now, I'm not allowed to use the name of the drug due to legal reasons, but I can tell you it is a semaglutide and is from a class of medicines called GLP-1s. It is usually administered as a weekly injection. Now, celebrities like Sharon Osbourne, Elon Musk, as well as Khloe Kardashian, and even Oprah Winfrey have all been linked in some way or another to this drug. So, I decided to go on a fact-finding mission on the Carol Ofori podcast. And in the first part of this episode, I speak to three people who have experience with using this drug for weight loss. And then, I speak to an endocrinologist who tells us more about this GLP-1 and its off-label use for weight loss, as well as other ways for us to lose weight. So, this episode begins with my conversation with Robin Fitzpatrick and her 19-year-old son, Michael, who have both been using this medication for weight loss, as well as Michael's father, Chris Fitzpatrick, who is a sports nutritionist and former bodybuilder. Now, whenever you hear the it is because we're not allowed to use the name of the drug. Here's the father, Chris. Michael in particular, Mm. obviously he was a candidate for something relative to weight loss. Um, and we've been trying to find some solutions for him a while back. Uh, he was diagnosed as insulin resistant. So we went down the route of diet, metformin, which was the one? I think we were yeah. uh, Nothing really seemed to be helping. So when this popped up on the radar, it was certainly something we were investigating and wanting, wanting to try with him. So what sparked everything was him being insulin resistant. Correct, yeah. For layman, what does that mean? No, that just means that your body is unable to absorb insulin any further to allow you to absorb the glu- the glycogen that's circulating in your body. Okay. So your body's technically working against you. Right. So whatever carbohydrates that you eat that your body digests, puts into the bloodstream, it cannot then absorb that to use it as energy. The layman's terms is going to just translate it to fat. So here we go. We find out your son is insulin resistant. What happens next? No, even more so that um, Robin also had a hormone profile done and they couldn't quite work out why she was gaining weight as well. I uh-huh. have. Diet was right, training was right, everything else. And her endocrinologist actually um, prescribed this for her as a solution to offsetting, let's call it early menopause and the inability to manage m- metabolic action. Right. Certainly the two of them are prime candidates for it. So I'll start with you, Robin. How long have you been on a year. And how has life changed for you from before to now a year later? Well, I started putting on weight um, when I hit 40 and the doctor just said, well, you know, it's midlife. Yes. Um, and your body is going to change and your all your blood levels are 100% according to your weight. And I just, oh, your age, sorry. And I just wasn't happy with that. Mm-hmm. Hence, we're going to the endocrinologist and she just, she said that my estrogen, progesterone and testosterone, they were all zero. Right. Uh, and that's why I couldn't... So it's menopause, yeah. It's just menopause, yeah. Postmenopausal. Right, postmenopausal. Yeah. And since taking it, are you finding that you're, you're regulating, you're losing weight? What's the experience been? Yes. Yeah, so I was a bit nauseous in the beginning, but it definitely changed my flavor profile for food. Like, and your feeling of satiety, I was always full. You know, you just have a little bit... I mean, I'm a big foodie. I love eating. I love yeah. cooking. Yeah. And I just couldn't... I'm happy to cook, but yeah. um, smaller meal, smaller portions... And, I mean, my training's always been the same. Right. But, yes, it's much easier running with a lot less weight. Right, of course, yeah. And to you, Michael, since you were diagnosed insulin resistant, how long have you been using and what has it been like for you before and now? I think it's about a year now, is it? Not even that long. Not even about six or eight months. Oh, wow. I've almost completely stopped eating mainly one meal a day in the evenings. Always feel full. As my mom says, yeah, just full all the time. And the weight seems to fall off. Right. Yeah, he's probably lost 25 kilos. In six to eight months? Yeah. That's but that's the entire action of this product you alluded to in the beginning. Yes. It's off-label. Yes. Because it's actually a type 2 diabetes drug. Right. So, But however, once it's been approved, you can pretty much prescribe it for anything that you want to and right. it still f- conforms within the norms. So that's what I was, I was listening to some podcasts earlier on. In America, that's one of the, what one of the doctors actually said. Provided it's passed the FDA approval, right. you can prescribe it for anything thereafter doesn't have to stay in the class of a type 2 diabetes drug. And because it's got such 
massive weight loss function, it's become the trend now. And unfortunately, I think people do abuse it. So I've even said the same thing to Robin. She's lost enough weight. Yeah. You shouldn't continue using it right. because you're taking advantage of the system now. And again, it's, we don't know what its side effect is going to be. That's what I actually thing. wanted to jump into. Yeah. Like how, um, so the, use it if you need it. Right. Because I think being overweight or being insulin resistant or being diabetic yeah. is more harmful than to you than the potential side effects that may come about as a result of semi-glutide. Right. Overweight, hypertension, high blood pressure, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you name it, all of the, the, the major killers. Yeah. So rather lose the weight, and if you have a side effect from thereafter, then well, let's deal with that next. Are you worried, Robin, for example, that you will stop using it, as Chris is saying, and, and then get and get fat again? Yes, I'm terrified. So what are your thoughts on the fact that there are people right now in South Africa who can't access the medication because some of us are using it for weight loss and not necessarily to stay alive? Well, is it the person that's using its fault or is it the doctor that's prescribing it in conjunction with you as the patient who's that fault? Fair answer. So I, I think it's just the end of the day the doctor caves in and says, okay, well, I'll prescribe it for you. Do you think it's abused in South Africa? I think it's abused worldwide, no doubt, because it's the easy route. Nobody wants to stand in front of the fridge and say, oh, I'm starving. I'm, I'm not going to eat because I need to lose weight. Yeah. It's easier to take something like this and then you don't eat for days. One of the side effects is? Nausea. And no, serious. Yeah. And pancreatitis, which yeah. is pretty hectic. And that's what they're very worried about is the pancreatitis. And yeah. what is a pancreatitis? So the action is that it releases this GLP-1, which signals to the brain that you are not, not hungry, or it increases the satiety feeling of being full. But at the same token, it releases, promotes the release of insulin from the pancreas. And consistent dosing and regular use puts strain on the pancreas because it's continuing to work to release insulin into the bloodstream to take the glucose away. So because you've got circulating glucose, you need insulin to bond with it and take it into a muscle cell to convert it to energy. So the, the pancreas is continually releasing insulin, not just as a result of when you eat. And when you eat, any sugars in your bloodstream tell a signal to the pancreas to release insulin so that your body can absorb it. All right. Whereas now the drug is telling your pancreas to release it all the time. So it just puts stress on the pancreas. So then mm -hmm. pancreatitis is it's hugely painful. Yeah. So Michael experienced it probably two weeks ago, three weeks ago. Yeah. Oh, three weeks tell ago. me about what was that? It's mm. excruciating pain right underneath your stomach. It's on the it's, left hand You can't side. do anything. It's mm -hmm. debilitating. And so with that in mind, are you going to continue with for sure. It so, makes so much of a difference. But I might think, as well just I think it. it's important that you just need to identify when the dosing is wrong or the re or the frequency of the dosing is wrong. So in that case there, certainly. Are yeah. worried about um, pancreatic cancer from these things? With the, Again, the it's only medicine. five, six years old. We don't know that yet. Yeah, yeah. there's no pancreas. I mean, you die. That's hectic. There's medication that you guys are using that could lead to that. My choice. Okay. Yeah. But if we go back to the beginning and say yeah. there's a person that is diabetic, that mm. is overweight, that's yeah. got pressure on their heart, they've got high blood pressure, they've got cholesterol, they're also in the same threat zone. To yeah. Do. So in that instance, I think you're going to do anything to be able to reduce your weight to right. give yourself a better fighting chance of living longer. So having spoken to Robin and her son Michael about their weight loss journey, I decided I simply had to contact an endocrinologist to tell us more about weight loss and of course the options available. Dr. Sandeep Ruda is a modern mystic doctor with 22 years experience as a medical doctor and 14 years in the field of endocrinology. Dr. Ruda, thank you so, so much for joining us on the Carol Afori podcast. Thank you, Carol. Thanks for having me. I'm not sure where you got the modern mystic part. I think my staff are having a go with me. <laughs> <laughs> that was actually going to be my first question to you is, what is a modern mystic doctor? I don't know, but my patients seem to think uh, this uh, practice is quite philosophical. And uh, so I suppose we have an interesting outlook on health and a more holistic outlook. So you get all sorts of labels, but nothing magical that we do. All logical. Yeah. All logical. Now, for many people, mm. an endocrinologist is something that uh, many have not heard of. What does an endocrinologist mm. do? So endocrinology in its uh, simple terms is the study of the diseases that affect the hormonal systems of the body. So there are hormones that regulate physical functions. And the very word hormone means to set in motion. So actually, these hormones are set in motion by something, you know, and, uh, you know, generally, um, even in mind, body medicine and that sort of thing, uh, we believe thinking patterns can set your hormones in motion a certain way. But the common way hormones are set in motion are due to some resting rhythm that exists in the body and through our interaction with the world our sleep cycle, our dietary patterns, our activity patterns, stress levels, you see. And then 
these hormone systems to try and maintain the symphony of life, if you want to put it, uh, and the conductors for that. But things can go wrong with those systems. So endocrinology is the study of those hormone systems in those normal states and what can go wrong with them and how we can help mend those issues for better health. Now, since we're sticking with <clears throat> hormones, I'm very curious about, are hormones a factor to obesity? Yes and no. I think we have to be very clear of the definition of obesity. But in science and in medicine, obesity is defined as a human state in which there's excessive fat accumulation. And fat is the energy storehouse of the human body. Right. So when we say something is excessive, it means it's gone beyond what is necessary for human health. And it, in its excessive uh, form, it can be deleterious to health, bad for your health. So excessive energy can only accumulate in the body through an excessive or net positive energy balance. There has to be more energy going out than what you're using through activity. And that is a law of physics and science. Mm-hmm. So if you get good published studies, and this is not a judgment on anyone, we're not saying that patients with obesity are causing it to themselves. But overeating and a lack of physical activity are the major contributors to the obesity pandemic. But then you've got to break it down. Why is the overeating happening? So you could look at it from a social cultural perspective. We've actually social culturalized a lot of eating phenomenon that are abnormal as normal. For example, eating at parties, starters, desserts, after dinner mints, you know, snacking between meals, all sorts of ideas about um, entertainment foods and mm-hmm. soft drinks and energy drinks. So we culturalize these things. So innocently, People will adopt culture if you don't question it. And culture in today's terms can also be bad for us, not necessarily good. You see, people may overeat due to peer pressure, emotional eating, stress eating, isn't it? Or lack of knowledge on what is healthy eating. So the overeating part is not a judgment or a criticism on humans. It's that it is happening, but there are many reasons why it's happening. Physical inactivity, simply put, can also happen for many reasons. Workspace scenarios, sedentary jobs, lack of knowledge of how much activity is necessary, environmental considerations like uh, access to healthy facilities, parks. Crime in South Africa is a big issue. People are afraid to run on the roads, you know. So lots of things can affect our ability to be active. Uh, I would also say environment from a food marketing point of view or junk food marketing influences eating behaviors largely. So because of those factors, once the weight is up, you can get no hormonal disruption in your body. So the weight in itself leads to hormonal disruption, you see. And uh, those patients then, even with healthy diets and exercise, consistently over a period of time, are unable to lose weight beyond a certain amount because of that hormonal disruption. And those are the ones that may need some additional treatment to assist them. And the last point I'll make, Carol, is there are hormonal diseases in and of themselves that contribute to the risk of weight gain. Mm -hmm. So you can have like the active thyroid, for example, that you will need to treat the primary condition if you're going to assist that patient with weight loss. And there are certain periods of life where certain peoples may be vulnerable or more sensitive to weight gain. And that's, for example, during the menopausal change, which is not a disease, but a change of season. But context matters. So in a modern urban environment, where a lot of the risk factors for obesity, women are more likely to gain weight around that time. Sometimes when you look at some studies done abroad, and I work sometimes in India, uh, in a village there, you don't see so much of the symptoms that you would see in terms of weight gain around menopause in those areas, you know. So those are the periods of time that are vulnerable periods, but context matters. So right. I hope I broadly sort of help you understand how obesity is caused. I think it would be a bit risky to say it's purely hormonal because it would detract from the root causality, which is looking at our interaction with the world in terms of how we eat, why do we eat. See, diet and exercise shouldn't be words that we run away from. And I, I do understand the stigma around it. There's a judgment around it. But you got to look at it in terms of its original definition. The word diet has a meaning of sense of proportion. Activity is action is the insignia of life. And why are humans 
not aware today of how to do that correctly to achieve better health. So recently, Oprah has lost a staggering amount of weight, and I'm referring obviously to Oprah Winfrey. And she is mm. just turned 70 earlier this year. She looks absolutely phenomenal. Um, she's one mm. person who's in the public eye who struggled with her weight throughout her, her years. Mm-hmm. And she recently right. said that she did not understand obesity until it was broken down to the level where someone mm. explained to her that obesity is an actual disease and a gene and that when Mm -hmm. you're born with the fat gene inverted commas your chances Mm -hmm. of evading weight gain and obesity are unlikely and therefore it should be treated in some way or another as a disease what would you say to that is there such a thing as an obesity gene or a fat gene and how does one know that you are predisposed to this gene so to my knowledge, there isn't a single fat gene. And I would start off also perhaps by saying that what we hear from celebrity personalities in the media should always be taken with a bit of speculation and independent critical thinking, right? Uh, these are people at a level of wealth and excess that they can do whatever they please with their bodies. And this particular personality, if I recall, Her weight loss journey has been quite a lot of up and down. And previously, even when she's lost weight, there's been a lot of hype around her weight loss. And then people want to follow those methods. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying it's wrong or right or criticizing the individual personality. But I think things like that should be taken with a grain of salt. You should do your independent investigation. To date, many genes have been identified. They call single nucleotide polymorphisms that may contribute to weight gain. And I can't remember the exact number. I stand to be corrected. When I last looked some years ago, it was over 200 little genes that may contribute to weight gain. But Carol, when we looked at the individual contribution of those genes to actual weight, it was somewhere between a few grams, up to one gene called the FTO gene, and you had to carry both alleles, two copies of the gene, was three kilograms, you see? So the common variety genes that people carry for weight gain will add a few grams to 150 grams of weight to the body, which doesn't explain the current pandemic of obesity in its current form, which is kilos of weight gain, you see? Now, people are using treatments for weight loss, but they're not addressing a genetic abnormality. Mm -hmm. They are addressing the hormonal abnormality that I told you becomes established with weight gain. It's a neuroendocrine issue, you see? which makes it difficult to lose weight. And that's where some of the new therapies have designed. But I think it would be irresponsible to say there's a single fat gene causing weight gain. I think genetics has humbled us a lot. That even previously with other diseases, after the human genome was transcribed, we thought it's going to cause a huge overnight revolution in weight. But epigenetics is teaching us that genes are not deterministic. They influence your health. But that influence is a combination of genes meeting the environment, you see. And environment seems to be playing a big role in human health. And it's not environment in and of itself. The human is the species with the dilemma of choice. And if we don't look at it that way, we tend to look for very simple ways and quick fix type of ways, Mm -hmm. which in my experience in medicine has never really worked, you know. Would you say, doctor, that South Africa has an obesity problem? Definitely. If you look at the numbers, last figures I checked, it's about 67 to 70 percent of women with obesity 34% minimum of men and a huge proportion of the population because you see when you say obesity it's not when we're talking about it from a health perspective yes it is psychologically difficult for the patient there's a cosmetic issue around it appearance uh, self uh, uh, sense and that sort of thing becomes an issue but there's also the health consequences Because once your body mass index is in the obese category, health complications tend to increase. Those are cardiovascular, diabetes, which is also highly prevalent in this country, coronary artery disease, which follows on cholesterol, hypertension, all the common stuff is linked to obesity. Then it affects hormones. 
Men can get low testosterone, infertility, hypogonadism. Women can get infertility, estrogen dominance, and polycystic ovary syndrome symptoms are amplified with weight gain. Underestimated, Carol, is cancer risk with obesity. Wow. So it has been found to be a risk factor for most of the common cancers today, including breast, colon, pancreatic, kidney, ovarian, and endometrial or womb cancer, uterus, you see. So when you think about that kind of causation, as many other things, There's sleep apnea, there's arthritis, knee and uh, lower back pain. You get anxiety and depression linked to obesity. So, you know, many doctors and specialists are treating these things in silos. If you look at the root of it, there's this obesity pandemic at the center of it. And I think if we can address that through a depth of thinking, we can reduce a lot of the health issues in this country, costs, and of course, improve quality of life and uh, that sort of thing in the long term. So I think obesity needs a deep look. Mm. It's not just how perhaps the lay person may think of it. There are many aspects to it, you know. So I've spoken, I've just spoken to a mother and son who are using mm-hmm. a particular drug for obesity. And it's yeah. meant for type 2 diabetes or for, for weight loss. Can you tell us yeah. more about this now becoming very popular drug? Yeah. So there are approved weight loss treatments or treatments for obesity, just like we have cholesterol medications for high cholesterol and blood pressure treatments for blood pressure, they are now approved medically trialed medications that can be indicated for the treatment of obesity. And they belong to different classes based on the mechanisms by which they work at all, right? So the particular drug you're talking about, and the audience may wonder why we're not using names, because it is a sensitive area and there's been a lot of indiscriminate use. But I can tell you the class of drugs we're talking about is called GLP-1 receptor agonist. Now, GLP-1 is a hormone in the body that's, that we call it uh, incretin hormone. Its natural effect is to lower the appetite thermostat. So you get more satiety and feeling of fullness after a meal. It uh, reduces hunger. Um, it directly causes weight loss through various mechanisms, but it also enhances the work of the pancreas in insulin release. It lowers blood sugar. It has positive effects on cardiac health, on uh, beta cell function in the pancreas, uh, lowering cholesterol and anti-inflammatory effects. So these are nice hormones in our body. And what has been shown is that in obese patients or patients with obesity and in patients with diabetes, not enough of this hormone is being made. So if you give this hormone in the right dosages, lower dosages are used for patients with diabetes. And in that group, the lower dosages of these drugs were very useful in reducing sugar and reducing risk of heart attacks, almost a life-saving drug in diabetic patients. And this was a big revolution for us in diabetes care, where with once a day or once a week injections, we were getting excellent sugar control and better outcomes. And then that research was redone and translated in non-diabetic patients with obesity. And they found that higher dosages of those same drugs, GLP-1 analogs, were useful in obesity. So the drugs, I'll give you the active ingredient names, were liraglutide Mm -hmm. and semaglutide. That's the two GLPs approved for weight loss. And there may be new ones in the pipeline, which we don't have in South Africa, like tazepatide and stuff that may come um, on the horizon that are promising better efficacy, but side effects need to be weighed. So if a patient has a body mass index over 27, plus some weight-related complications, or just a body mass index over 30, then liraglutide 3 milligrams, the higher dose GLP, can be used for weight loss. It is available in this country and is approved for weight loss. So that's there. The problem came in when the semaglutide, there is a weight loss version. It's a higher dose of about 2.4 milligrams, and it wasn't available in this country. But when it became popular on social media, and and they ran short of it in Western countries, people started using the diabetic lower dose version of it for weight loss. And we don't want to talk about off-label use, but a lot of it was not in the obesity field. It was just for weight loss. And the indiscriminate use ultimately led to or contributed, I can't say it was the only cause, of a shortage of that drug. So GLP drugs are available for weight loss. They are approved weight loss versions, and they certainly can help patients who are on an otherwise good diet and exercise program, psychological behavioral support. They're a good add-on 
to assist patients to get to their weight goal and uh, then try and maintain it in the long term. I hope that's clarified how we think about that. Look, there are other classes of weight loss drugs as well that work more centrally. They're non-hormonal and they work on the brain in uh, addressing cravings. So there's a class using medications like bupropion and naltrexone. There's another one that works on fat absorption in the stomach, you see. Yeah. So every doctor needs to tailor the medication according to the individual in front of them based on the individual state, the patient's desires, accessibility, and then benefits versus risks and costs and all of that stuff and clinical criteria as well, right? Right. Now, staying with with risks Mm. and costs and clinical Mm. criteria, please unpack for us the problems around the use of GLP drugs for weight loss and, and of course, the shortage there is for people who have type 2 Mm -hmm. diabetes. So these medications are revolutionary in the field of non-communicable diseases, and they are quite helpful. One of the biggest issues with them has been inaccessibility due to costs, and it's a tough field. For example, funders would fund a GLP-1 that reduces heart attack risk in a patient who's had diabetes and a heart attack, who's deemed a high-risk patient. So that makes sense. They will fund it according to the clinical criteria of the trial. But outside of that, you have to do cost-to-benefit ratios, and they don't get funded. In the field of obesity, the health economics becomes a big issue. A Harvard review that I listened to a few weeks back suggested that it was more cost-effective to look at lifestyle changes than using these, these medications in the current cost. They're very expensive drugs. So I think excess has been an issue. And I think the nuances around that still need to be worked out in improving access. But how low do you go with cost? There's a question, philosophically speaking, among some of us that when health interventions become too accessible, what about then the impetus to self-regulate as well? You know, is removing that perhaps a concern? And I can't say that either approach is right or wrong, but what's the middle line? And I think we need to have that discussion with some maturity and depth. The other issue is the GLP-1 uh, treatments are not tablets. They are injectables. So they need to be given into the skin, which some people with counseling who fear needles can tolerate. The most common side effects are nausea, gastric side effects, bloating, sometimes diarrhea and vomiting, which can be intolerable to quite a few patients. And a majority of patients, if you introduce the drug slowly with a low dose, they do adapt and develop tolerance. And in certain high-risk patients, there is a small risk of pancreatitis. So you should tell coach patients about alcohol use, smoking, that sort of thing. Yeah. There's been some discussion around thyroid cancer. So certainly these drugs are contraindicated in a certain group of patients that have a genetic form of thyroid cancer. It's called medullary carcinoma of thyroid, which is very rare. But uh, it's generally not been thought to cause common form of thyroid cancer. Although that space in more recent research with increased use there's a little bit more emphasis to ask, you know, based on data that's coming out, is there a slight increased risk of certain forms of thyroid cancer? The evidence currently states that the benefits of the drugs on obesity outweigh that risk. So they're still safe to use and they're okay. So I think that's more or less the side effect profile to be aware of. The cost is an issue, access issue, and then the needles, you know. The needles, yeah. So that's about that particular class. Yeah. And then, uh, look, the original weight loss version of liraglutide is available in this country. And then there are other drugs like naltrexone and bupropion. So I think if physicians stick to what is available and channel things to stay within their lanes, there shouldn't be a problem. I think the current issue, and perhaps we wanted to discuss that, is that social media and the media space, mainstream media, especially celebrities, tend to influence health choices a lot. And, uh, you know, I don't know if that's been aggressively handled because there is that social responsibility that must come with depth. And I don't know, I don't have the answers to that, to be honest. You know? Yeah, you did touch on a bit earlier about the term off-label. Mm-hmm. What, is, what does that mean? Mm-hmm. See, the term off-label means using a medication outside of the parameters for which it is registered for. So you get a drug used for a certain condition A, right? But during the trial, it shows some other benefits that were not the primary reason why the drug was studied. Mm -hmm. Do you see what I'm saying? But that drug, when it comes to market, is registered for that original issue. But it's known and the safety being studied. So off-label means, 
and this has to be done understanding medical ethics, uh, you know, uh, justice, beneficence, non-maleficence, and autonomy. So patient autonomy comes in here where in a given situation, drug A may benefit another condition, but it's not registered for that. But the doctor, through his experience and theoretical understanding of the science and fact, thinks it may be useful. He explains the pros and cons to the patient of this off-label use, right? And the patient then reasons it out and through an autonomous and logical discussion decides, okay, I'm going to go ahead with that. But actually you've got to sign waivers and stuff to say, I cannot be held liable for side effects that may occur outside of the registered indications, you see? So there's a process in off-label that can be done in certain situations but there's a whole process around it that must be done consciously and responsibly. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of medications in the world that have been used off-label. It's not a wrong thing, but I'm just highlighting the principles of it. You see. So would you say so, that it is generally irresponsible to use drugs off-label? It's responsible if it's done under guidance for greater benefit than harm with the patient's buy-in and some sort of informed consent process that has been engaged. It can be okay. That's what okay. we're saying. Okay. But when people demand an off-label drug from doctors and pharmacists based on a desire from a social media blurb and insist I must just use this for weight loss without some discussion, without some planning, without looking at the medical indications and all of that stuff, you put yourself at risk, both the practitioner and the patient. All right. So do you think that the drugs being prescribed off-label for obesity should be indicated for obesity too, considering it's also a disease? So they have been registered drugs for obesity. That's what I'm saying. But that version is just not available in the country yet. Right. Which is why people are using the non-registered version. So yeah. if I stop taking these GLP-1 drugs for weight loss, the moment I stop mm -hmm. taking it because maybe I've reached my desired weight or maybe financially I've reached a point where I can't afford mm -hmm. them anymore because I believe they're quite expensive to source. Does the mm -hmm. weight all return? You know, some of the scientific trials have shown some regain of weight on stopping medication, right? The way, and, and there's a bit of a gray zone here because we don't have South African guidelines on obesity treatment. The Lancet Commission on labeling uh, obesity as a disease has a few questions. Like, see, if you just label it as a disease, then you're saying this medication has to be chronic, like how we've made blood pressure treatment chronic and cholesterol treatment as chronic. And the question is, is that so for obesity? And there is a school of thought that patients should continue these medications lifelong. There's others, and I'm of the other school of thought, is that we can use these medications for a prolonged period and constantly work on behavioral modification through depth, logic, cognitive behavior therapy, that patients have a paradigm shift on their approach to life. And as the weight comes down and a time comes where they want to not use medication or don't need it or can't afford it or whatever it is, I've got patients like that in practice who are sustaining their weight loss because they're in a new rhythm. Now, it's different strokes for different folks. I think if you're younger and you do that earlier, it is a better outcome. I think when physiology or pathophysiology or disturbances are more established, it can be difficult later in life. So I think you can individualize the approach on the chronicity of the use of these drugs. You know, Most weight gain after stopping the drug is also due to relapse of lifestyle. I would also say, Carol, in the mm -hmm. real world using drugs, remember in a clinical trial, Everybody is on a consistent diet and exercise regimen and the drug. But when you put the drug into the real world, your results vary according to patients' lifestyles. It's a big issue. So I can tell you there are patients whose lifestyles are still not healthy mm. and they'll use the drug and they'll find after a year the weight is being maintained, but they haven't lost weight. They haven't gained either. Sure. There are others who got the good buy-in. And they will get diet, exercise, mind sorted. And they're taking the drug and they're feeling motivated. They'll get excellent weight loss over a year. They want to come off the drug. And then they maintain this motivated, positive lifestyle. And I've got a few patients now, two or three years later, who are maintaining their weight. Remember in South Africa, we've had these drugs around only for about five years now. So that's the experience from a time perspective. Yeah. There are others who take the drug and uh, gain weight, in fact, right? And uh, it's absolutely because there's no change in lifestyle. So the amount of weight gained may be less without the drug. And then there's also about 
25 to 30 percent of patients that are slow responders by their nature and perhaps their genetics may play a role or some physiology so they don't lose more than five percent of their weight in four months and we generally don't continue the drugs in them and a huge cohort stopped the drugs because of the chronicity of some of the side effects they don't like nausea burping that sort of thing for the long term <laughs> yeah they just want to get off it you know right so what I'm expressing is from the clinical experience there's still, uh, it's not as simple as it looks sometimes on social media. Oh, if you use this, it's the holy grail, you know. And uh, that's why I think you've got to be cautious. But there is benefit. So I think with the right approach, a lot of people can benefit. Yeah. So in your view, what is the best form of weight loss? What is the best method of weight loss? Because I've always heard the saying, eat less, move more. That's the answer to weight loss. But for some people, it's it's deeper than that, right? So as an endocrinologist, what would you say is your top five ways to, to have the weight loss? Yeah, so this is maybe why some people are calling me weird names like mystic or whatever it is. But uh, Carol, you know, um, we, we're a modern species in the year 2024. And as much as we think we are technologically advanced, it seems the modern human who's supposed to be the masterpiece of creation or evolution, whatever we believe in, seems to find himself in a state of a lot of problems, depression, dejection, disease, divorce, a lot of destruction around the world. And it's begged the question as a doctor for 22 years, why is this all this happening while the world is advancing in terms of science and technology? You don't find human beings with a sense of inner peace these days. So in my opinion, just saying eat less, exercise more is too simplistic. The question is, why are humans ending up in the state of obesity? And if you look at the data, we've got signs showing us that indiscriminate exposure to television, social media, poor sleep patterns, stress, food marketing, so many things, sleep disturbances, job strain, all of these things are contributing to weight gain. So the issue is not just simply diet and exercise, is really looking at the individual's position in society and relationship with the world. And what is the world currently? A government's creating policies and environments conducive for human actualization of the goal of human life, which is happiness and bliss. And how do we do that? Is it purely in acquisition and enjoyment? Is the approach of work, work, work to make more money, to pay off debts and bonds and cars and entertainment and alcohol on the weekends and going out and holidays, the only approach that a human can approach? Or is there another way to find inner bliss? And I know I'm posing a very deep sort of answer to your question, which has more questions. But I think perhaps the obesity crisis is a pointer that we need to relook at everything. It perhaps cannot be business as usual and nature got it wrong and we got to fix nature. I think perhaps nature is trying to say, hey, human, you're looking in the wrong places for what you want. It's not wrong to have a car. It's not wrong to have a house. It's not wrong to go on holiday. But perhaps your mind has set an idea that that's the only place you're going to find it. And if you test the theory, Carol, in my life, in your own life, our audience listening can question this. Wherever you thought something is going to give me happiness, it doesn't end up so, the snares of 99. When I get that car, I'll be happy. When you get that car, you're tired with it, you want the next one, the mm. next one. It seems the chase never ends. And in that chase, we're finding ourselves in the state of dis-ease. If you mm. look at all the risk factors for obesity, it's linked to that chase. So I think that's the philosophical part that needs to be answered. And perhaps a lot of your listeners have a cultural and a religious background. And I think I'm big on this these days, that the logical pursuit of scriptural ordinance, by scriptural ordinance, I mean the knowledge of scripture. You see, religion today needs to be looked at with a scientific logic. When great godmen or prophets have said things like, the kingdom of heaven is within you, the middle line is the path. When a prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, advised his people to eat one third food, one third water and leave a space of one third air. Was he not alluding to a sense of proportion? You see, mm -hmm. uh, the moderation of Buddha in his fasting to just two meals a day. You know, the question must be, these are people that went through a lot of difficulties in their lives to attain a state of inner bliss that the world could not affect them. And I think that spiritual truth has been lost in modern society where we're trying to find it only in a materialistic pursuit. Mm. So 
between the question of moderating the outer and building the inner is the answer to fulfilling human destiny, which is finding happiness. And in doing that, the obesity crisis will disappear. Do you see my take on it? It's slightly different. Absolutely. It's not just a street obesity as something out there and just yeah. medicalize it. Yeah. I think the medical component is a part of the process for where we are. But we are a knowledge-based species with the dilemma of choice. And the question becomes, on what basis do we make our daily choices? What did Christ mean when he said, you got to lose this life to find it? Me, he who loses it for my sake shall find it. What did Prophet Muhammad mean when he said to the Arabs, what you're seeking is closer to you than your jugular vein? What did Buddha mean when he said, what you're seeking is nirvana? And the definition of nirvana is a mind without the fire of thoughts and indiscriminate desires. So it seems the work we have to do is on the mind and our desires through scriptural knowledge, which is the fundamental values of life, objectivity, unselfishness, having a direction, duties must trump rights, you know, yeah. uh, camaraderie, or cooperation rather than competition, uh, reverence for nature and the laws that govern it, you know, these things have been completely lost in my opinion. So we've separated ourselves and it's almost like we suffer for it. It's not a punishment. You know, when you put your finger into a fire, you're going to burn. You can't say the fire is hurting you, the fire is punishing you. It's by the action. And this is a last point I'll make, Carol. I think it's very important that every human being has absolute freedom to choose whatever they want. We cannot judge choices. But what we are bound by is the consequences of the choice when we have made it. That is not up to us. If you put that finger into the fire, I'm going to burn. You see, that's the laws of nature. Gravity goes down mm. 30, uh, what's it, 10 meters per second squared or whatever it is. That's a law. We can't change that. And we have to be a bit intuitive about the laws of the mind. And those are fundamental values, I think. Yeah. Yeah, that is so powerful. How now I get the mystic doctor. <laughs> I get I it know now. It's like I said, it's all logic, but anyway. No, absolutely. I think you unpack it so so eloquently, and you've painted the picture quite beautifully. Mm. Because I think a lot of people who suffer with obesity and weight would say mm. that it's not just picking up a pie and eating it. There's so much to the mm. backstory, and if we just look at the rising numbers in South Africa of obesity and the circumstances mm. which we live in as South Africans, just mm-hmm. you know, the crisis that we are living in with regards to water, with regards to power, uh, jobs, Mm -hmm. crime, all of these things are psychological. And I think a lot of us negate the fact that it affects us so much. Every day, we just kind of move like robots, not realizing how that movement affects us internally and contributes significantly to the rising obesity numbers. So I think you couldn't have said it better, Doc. I guess my final question to you is, is there anything else you just feel that everybody needs to think about when they think about the, the concept of obesity, the concept of weight loss, and the concept of using drugs? for this management? You know, I got this quote I sometimes use with patients, and this was based on some reading and research into what we call a perception change about obesity. So I can quote this because it's in a scientific journal. There was an early trial done using psychedelics like uh, psilocybin and LSD in a controlled clinical trial in patients with resistant obesity. And what happened in this trial is obviously, you know, with psychedelic substances, mind experiences a change of perception of life and reality for a moment. And under guidance, this trial was done. And the perception change that was experienced by these patients with obesity led to long-term behavioral changes automatically with weight loss. So it's exactly the point I'm making. What I'm trying to do is with knowledge to create the perception change. And please note, I'm not suggesting that psychedelics cause weight loss. And I'm not saying you should use. This was a clinical trial on the perception issue. When people see higher vision of life, your behaviors will automatically tend towards fulfilling that higher purpose, you see? And you got to think about your life in those terms. When you put a secular boundary around your individual life, me, my, I, the ego gets amplified. It tends to want to gratify. And it's a very interesting psychological phenomenon. It creates all importance around itself. And it's a very tricky thing because sometimes it's superior, the ego. I know what I'm doing. But the minute it's called out, it goes into weak pity an inferior ego comes. I'm not worthy, you see. But the teachings of the masters is that every human is worthy. 
however they've called it. There's a Holy Spirit entity within soul, whatever you want to call it, that is perfection in itself. And because we have misidentified with that perfection, we have identified with the transient body, the changing mind and its oscillations, and that leads to the turbulence and wrong choices and the physical diseases we're seeing. So I always say to my patients to try and change their perception, assert your higher nature, right, whatever you want to call it, and negate. You must chant, I'm not the body, I'm not the mind, I'm not these thoughts. I am that infinite, I am perfection. I will manage the body, I will regulate my thoughts, and I will move towards this higher life. And as you think, so you become. I think that's a nice tool to use. Then at the body level, you use the right food, exercise, and medication. The mind is being cultivated through gardening, using knowledge tools, and scripture directs you through confidence of the experience of previous masters. Then you'll be okay. You'll be accepting of life. I think that would be the ideal long term. Wow. Dr. Sandeep Ruda, thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate you being on the Carol Ofori podcast. Thank you, Carol. It's a pleasure speaking to you. That's the Carol Ofori podcast. For thought-provoking conversations, listen at ecr.co.za under podcasts or your favorite podcast app.